think I'm live. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, today, we're going to be doing a live stream around uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines. Um, my guest will be hopefully joining me here soon. And um, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background uh, of why I'm interested in this topic in particular. Um, and uh, before we kind of do that, just going to throw this question out here. If you're watching, um, could you drop a, a quick comment just telling me kind of uh, what kind of work you do? Because I'm, I'm really curious about who's interested in what kinds of streams. And so if you're a software developer or doing IT operations or like, like Mark here, who's somewhere in the middle doing dev build, test and support ops, I'm interested in figuring out who needs what and who needs what kind of examples. Um, so this is gonna be really helpful for me, but a little bit of a story time kind of thing here. Um, the way I got into Ward the Maps was actually when I was a configuration engineer. What is a configuration engineer? I'm not sure, but what that looked like for me was basically paying attention to the software development process. Um, someone with IT oriented skills, like I was a former systems administrator, uh, I did a lot of like configuration management and dealing with virtualized infrastructure and making sure that, you know, VMs had enough, you know, had, were taking care of the care and feeding of virtual machines, uh, making sure they had disk space and all that kind of fun stuff. And um, that background set me up to do this configuration engineering role, which ended up being more people focused. Um, the people focused kind of frame of this is like the process, right? So people process technology is kind of the trifecta and you can't really separate the people from either of the other two things. Like the people are constantly fiddling with the technology to make it work. They're also fiddling with the process and there's lots of negotiation that's happening between folks. Um, and so my job was to help make sure the process flowed and that just involved talking to people a lot and making sense of how ideas turned into JIRA tickets in this case, which then turned into code, which then got built and deployed and released and like ended up actually affecting people's lives. Um, and I worked in, uh, in sort of the medical side of things. And so our software needed to work and it needed to work well um, because otherwise people could get hurt. And so that mattered a lot um, and it was surprising how much the process of how software development gets built can affect that outcome. Um, so Wardly mapping, um, this is sort of the story that I tell um, when folks are kind of curious how I got into Wardly mapping. The way, the way I started was um, while I was doing this configuration engineering gig and I was working with my colleague on this, um, we were doing our best to keep the process running and to make little improvements here and there and to basically pay down some of the knowledge debt and some of the technical debt around the process. Um, and we basically one day were like offered, like, I think like $20,000 in like uh, basically CapEx spending. It's like, hey, here's $20,000 and the only way you can use this money is if you buy servers and we thought to ourselves, wait a minute, buying servers, like we love buying servers, we love playing with servers, we love all that stuff, but like, should we do it? Um, is that the right move? And uh, long story short, the answer was no. And the only way, the way we found that out was by locking ourselves in a conference room and making Wardly Maps for a really um, extended period of time. Like really the breakthrough moment was, oh my gosh, we don't have a strategy. We're just showing up to work and doing um, whatever people are asking us to do. And so making the map helped us realize, oh, we've got a lot of custom stuff. And by buying servers, we would be re we'd basically be doubling down on that custom stuff. And what we need to be doing instead is moving to commodity um, and SaaS products instead of um, doing that kind of doubling down. So with that, um, I'm gonna bring my guest in today. Um, we're going to bring in Jimmy Judd and Jimmy, can you hear me? Okay. Let's see. Maybe not. <laughs> there I am. Yay. Jimmy's here. Oh, so goodness. Jimmy's 
would you say you're a long time listener, first time caller? <laughs> yes, that is a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, um, what I was just giving folks was a quick overview of my background and what actually got me into worthy mapping, which was honestly making maps of continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines. So, um, Tell us a little bit about about your background and what kind of interests you in this subject matter. Um, I guess who do you work for and things like that might be an interesting place to start. Well, so I, I've worked for Ticketmaster for 24 years now. Wow. And I know. And I've been a programmer since I was in seventh grade, I guess. And that's too many years to talk about. Um, Excellent. Or just the right number of years. I mean... Um, well, yeah, I feel like a baby sometimes because I, I just turned 30 and I'm like, I, I don't understand how the world works. And people are telling me to talk to them about strategy. And it's just like, I can't wait to be doing this when I'm like 60. This is going to be fun. <laughs> but I, I can promise you it just keeps changing and keeps getting better and keeps getting more and more fun all the time. Mm. Excellent. And oh, okay. our, our mutual friend and colleague, um, Kat Swatel introduced us and uh, it, it seemed like it would be really, really exciting for us to kind of dig into this problem together. So, I mean, when, when, who gets excited about continuous integration and deployment, I guess. And, and <laughs> why are you interested in that subject in particular? Oh, so in my company, the people that get most excited and scared in the same breath are the operations people, the people <laughs> sitting at running the you know production systems. They want to see the releases happen faster, but not happen at all. Yeah, <laughs> you you got this lovely dichotomy right of software developers being incentivized to increase the rate of change in the company and trying to get as much new stuff released and as much change introduced into the system. And meanwhile, you've got operators on the other side of this. Um, I, I think. In the words of the the Phoenix Project, um, tossing the pig over the wall, <laughs> like here's here's the code ops. Good luck, go run it. Um, and that's got to be a frustrating dynamic. And and I, I know a little bit about that because I, I was an ops person for for a while doing uh, IT operations. Um, so so what's what's been your experience of around that, and and kind of what role does CI/CD play in that context? It, it's the rate of change that's the hardest part to deal with. Mm. How fast people are willing to take a chance. <laughs> you know, how big of a bang are you throwing at them? If you can throw a small one at them that they still feel like they're in control of, they're going to take it every time. Mm. Mm, okay. All right. So I'm not sure. Um, you probably can't see this because I'm, I'm just going to do some, some work in Miro. Uh, I, I'm not going to lie. I gave up on the video. Gotcha. I don't know what's different about your Zoom than the one I was playing with this morning, <laughs> but it didn't want to work for me. Oh, no. Okay, so one of the things you could probably do is you could tune into the stream maybe and then mute the audio on that, and that way you can at least see um, the screen share. Um, or I could screen share and Zoom if you can if you can see that. Um, no, I, I'm not going to try to watch your screen yeah. share, but go ahead. I can follow you very well. Okay. I'm very creative with that. Excellent. Okay, perfect. So um, we've got developers and we've got operators and we've got developers who are optimizing for um, change and we've got operations who is optimizing for sustainability. So I'm just like kind of drawing that out right now. Um, and then what you just pointed out is the size of the change is interesting. Um, so tell me a little bit more about that size of the change and trust. Yeah. The trust factor, right? How it's, Size of the change is probably the wrong word. It's the uh, the depth of the change, right? How different is their life going to be? How much more training do they need? Um, when you're, you know, being an, an ex-operations person myself, when you're on the front lines, you need to be able to fix it right now. Mm, okay. And so com comfort level matters a lot. Comfort level. So, so comfort level is in play here as well. Okay, very good. Excellent. Um, See, and now we're leaning towards some of the other stuff. When it comes to pipelines, I really like the idea of social practice theory mapping. Ooh, like okay. how, how well is the product accepted? Is it brand new to everybody and nobody uses it? <laughs> Got it. Okay, so social practice theory 
it might be a new um, idea for some folks here. And I'm just going to, if I'm remembering correctly, what, what are the three things? Is it meaning, material, and competence? Is that it? Yes. Excellent. Visibility is kind of the same as competence, I think. Okay. Or that's the evolution side. Got it. I, I haven't done a lot of work with social practice theory, so I'm going to lean on you heavily to sort of... It's okay. I've only done a lot of thought about it. I've seen it used once. Got it. And I got ecstatic about it and said, yeah, that's how I live my life now. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I mean, that, that's how I experienced, I mean, everything from the theory of constraints to Kinevin to Wardley mapping. To, I'm like... This just makes a lot of sense to me, and now my life is forever different. So here we go. Yes. Excellent. Tired of storytelling like I do. Ah, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I bet you could tell a good story, though. Um, all right. So then depth of change and comfort level. And there's something about batch size, I think, that's kind of curious here. So when we talk about the pipeline... Um, and, and continuous integration and continuous deployment. These are words that have meaning that I think might be contextual. Um, it's like DevOps, right? Like DevOps means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So maybe we could define some terms. And as we're building up this system, we're, we're, like mostly what I'm doing is just getting stickies on the board. I'm not trying to draw relationships yet. But maybe we could yeah. talk about what these words mean and, and get some, some of that um, kind of color on the on the mirror here. Okay, so for me, CICD as a whole is, is three steps. You really kind of want it to be four, though. Okay. So you, you build, you publish, you download and install. Build, publish, download, and install. All right, I've got all of those here. Those, that's the core. And you don't really gain very much by having just that core, but you enable yourself to have all the rest of it. Uh, your unit testing, your monitoring of your releases and automatic rollbacks and, and, and. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to do a trick. Um, so you, you've done a bit of worthy mapping, if I understand, right? Uh, yes. Excellent. So I'm not very good at value chaining. That's that's fine. I mean, we're not we're, what we're going to play with a little bit, I think, is um, there's yeah. this there's this lovely thing that I, I do kind of um, like value chains are fun, right? Because they show your relationships, but you don't need to all or nothing worthy mapping is kind of the thing that I tell people. So I like playing with evolution. I like playing with um, user journeys. I like playing with all these different parts of this set of practices. So what I'm kind of doing right now is um, like we, we could explore up and say, okay, what does this CICD, what kind of value does it produce for people? And we could explore down and say, well, what are the, those moving parts that are underlying this whole thing? Um, things like testing, things like um, release processes and so on. And like, it doesn't really matter which way we go, but one of the things I'm going to do here is use horizontal space a little bit differently. Um, okay. I'm going to use it two different ways. One is process oriented or value stream oriented, which I think is the pipeline part of this, the build, publish, download, install. Um, yep. The other way I'm gonna use it is for evolution. And the trick here is I'm going to use the space above the map around the process, around the value stream um, to use the process version of things. And I'm gonna use the space below and, and maybe, um, We'll, we'll use it even farther above, too, if we get start talking about needs. But I'm going to use the space below the value stream uh, from left to right to indicate evolution. Um, so that's just kind of how I'm going to build this out. And what I heard you say was that when you have the basics in place, you can start to – it, like, implicates all the other things. Is that the right way to say that? Uh, well, once you have those things automated, right, you're going to do all those steps to get software out no matter what. It's – do you have them completely automated? Okay. So let's let's maybe double click on some of these individual steps and kind of get an appreciation for what's happening behind each of those, those words. So when you say build, let's get a more granular appreciation for the parts of build. Like what is inside building software? 
So first up would be your your source control. Got it. So we're talking like subversion or Git or whatever it ends up being. Mercurial? Correct. <laughs> a per, a production Mercurial? system disk. Oh wait. Uh, um, <laughs> been there. Um, yep. 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 Okay. So source control. From there, it's got to go to an environment that has your compile. Okay. So placement in the environment, and then um, that's going to enable a compilation to occur. And, you know, determining automation will be determining the success and failure of your compilation. Uh, okay, so an indication of success or failure. And what I'm, what I'm doing underneath the build is basically making a tiny value chain based on what you're describing. And so at the very top of that value chain, I've got success fail indication. And that's your automated system that's parsing the output of the compilation to say, hey, the thing compiled, or hey, it didn't. You've got a problem, and here's your error message. Yeah, if you're automated, you get the immediate feedback from a pipeline saying, hey, this didn't work here. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, and the quality of that feedback, if you're doing this manually, is, well, yeah. Hard. Uh, <laughs> It's not a big deal if you only work in one environment, but if every code change you make has to go to say seven or eight different environments, that takes a really long time. Yeah, I, and um, are, are, do you, um, I, I wonder like, do, do you folks do like SRE kinds of things at Ticketmaster? Like are those that vocabulary and things familiar? Uh, yes. So like I'm thinking about the word toil and for, for everyone um, watching and listening, like toil being kind of the the repetitious um maybe you have a better better word for this but i just think like work that isn't fun isn't interesting and is repetitious and ought to be done by a computer is kind of how i think about toil is, is there a different kind of definition that you use around that or um so yeah i agree that it, it almost all toil should be automatable in some form or fashion, sometimes you have to restructure what's being done, though, mm. not just automate what the user's doing. Got it. So when we have kind of like the manual version of things, um, especially if it's a variable process, um, like, oh, like here, here are all these places where like there's a, a decision being made by a human. Like we need to uh, do this simple, in this environment. Simply like naming things. Oh, <laughs> you know, a, com a computer doesn't like free formed names. It wants you to version number things. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't like my uh, Star Trek themed uh, or whatever themed names of computers and things like that. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. And release numbers. It's hard to sequence things like that very well with a computer. Yeah, yeah, that's that's for sure. Um, although I, I do like um, seeing some of the, the practices around using human friendly names that are computer generated um, and indexed appropriately, that can be kind of helpful to get through some of these problems at times, I think. I, I, I agree. We've decided that amongst our team that we actually add a human friendly name as like the suffix of our versions. Got it. Yeah. All right. And then, then that way you're in a meeting talking about a problem and you're not saying version 0 0.4.12. <laughs> a lot of hot fixes. On oh, that. and that's a friendly version. <laughs> and that's before you deal with multiple, like, I, I don't know if we, um, you do multiple customer we, deployments or whatever, but yeah. We have a 45 year old VAX operating system. Cats. We're on VAX. version hundreds and something. Oof. <laughs> okay. I'm getting. I'm I'm not having a panic attack. I'm just having a reaction to <laughs> imagining how. I mean, it's amazing, right, that you have something that has provided value for so long. Um, but it's also like amazing how intense and, and and complicated things probably have become over the years. Correct. Uh, the biggest complication that we run into is that it's a structured database versus you know, anything relative or even dynamic, like everything's super tight block oriented. Got it. Okay. But otherwise we've got Bazel building all the lines of code. We've got unit test functionality. We've got, uh, we've had just recently a person come straight out of the university to write Vax assembly. So Whoa. it's not an impossibility. That's amazing. <laughs> awesome. All right. So looking at our, our pipeline here so far, uh, across the top, we've got our value stream of 
build, publish, download, and install. Now, underneath build, we're kind of double clicking on that and playing with a value chain. And from the bottom to the top, we have source control enables both placement in the environment, because we need to actually put the code in the place that where it can be built. Um, source control also directly enables compilation. Maybe that's a, the, a wrong thing to have there. Maybe we can fix that. But then I also have placement in the environment enabling compile. Um, and then compile is enabling success and fail indication. Um, so I think I'm going to make that change real quick. I'm going to just make this a straightforward thing uh, where it's going to be source control enables placement in the environment, placement in the environment enables compilation, and then compilation enables success fail. I think that's what I have you, so far. You nailed that source control part correctly. It's the triggering for automation that source control can provide for you, or you might have to pull for it, but either way. Okay, excellent. And then the other thing I think we're missing is artifacts, like output of so, the compilation process. Right, that's step two, pub publish. Ah, uh, okay, so it enables... So that's upon success, you need to publish. Okay, all right, so if we successfully... This is just build, this is just build and unit test at best, right? Yep. If you've got unit test. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah if oh my goodness okay having nightmares and flashbacks but that's okay um it's for the good of, of the people watching um which there are at least 10 of you out there watching and i appreciate you for being here um also uh i think i might have committed a faux pas earlier and margaret laughed very uh hard at that one um about your, your creativity with visualization and then um mark had something to say here um around the depth of change comment earlier. Um, and he wanted to ask if that was better described as risk of change. Um, I'm curious what your thought was on that before we kind of move on to the publish step here. I think that's the best category to put it in is how big of a risk is it? If you want to talk about cost value and risk, mm. and the, the risk is until the user actually understands everything, it's an unknown cost. So it's a huge risk. Um, it's unknown value too. Yeah, that that's really important, especially if you're taking an experiment-based approach to software. Um, yeah, which not all changes are experiment-based. Like some are pretty complicated, like or, or certain. Um, they have a certain kind of like cause and effect to them that's predictable up front. But um, if cost is uncertain and value is uncertain and risk is uncertain, like you're going to be in a world of hurt. Um, that Even makes... with, we're just high risk. I mean, you can't, yeah, with cost and value uncertain, risk is going to be high. There's just no way out of that. <laughs> That's, okay, yeah. That reminds me kind of like of, of um, like the risk matrix structure too, where um, impact and uncertainty, I, I forget what the, the right structure is because clearly I don't do this very often, but um, yeah, that's really helpful. And it helps me see some of the, the variables that are in play from the ops perspective in particular, because I think developers, their progress is measured by change. And, you know, are they closing out tickets and things like that? Um, but there's an interesting... And that's kind of, unfortunate because, yeah, that it should be measured by how happy their end user are, is. Yes, <laughs> yes. Value creation, what people are getting from it. Yeah. Um, and that's one of those ways that we, we kind of make the system smaller than it is. We pretend that it's just a, a loop of closing tickets instead of a loop of, yeah, closing tickets, but deploying software and delivering value. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Okay. And um, let's see. Uh, Margaret also asks, uh, could you offer a book re recommendation on social practice theory? And I know there's a book, but I don't remember what it's titled. Um, let me think here. I know in map camp last year, there was a person who actually did a social practice theory map for pipelines in particular. It's the best I can give you. There, I'm looking at a book cover that I've seen before. Um, there's a book by Elizabeth Shove, Matt Watson, and Mika Pantsar called The Dynamics of Social Practice, Everyday Life and How It Changes. Um, that's the one that I've I've seen recommended before, at least from the Jabes and Cats of the world. So that might be one to check out. Um, 
and I'll try to like copy and paste the the book cover here into the mirror board so you can uh, recognize it folks um, the dynamics of social practice okay so we're back to um, our value stream and um, CICD publish yep we've got our build done we've, we've got a success and fail indication um, and now as part of the output uh, sorry output of the compilation which actually a real quick clarifying question how where would you put unit tests in the sort of higher like the the, the way that things flow from placement in the environment to compilation to success fail indication kind of where do where do unit tests so right directly after build Okay. You put another check in there. Does everything run through unit tests? So first is compile successfully, and then do all your unit tests run successfully? Okay, excellent. And that becomes that becomes another short stop, right? It, yep. <laughs> A place where things can get um, checked. Short circuited. Yep. Excellent. And where we can catch the problems before they like. I remember one of the things that I always struggled with with Jenkins and whatever not was like getting things to stop at the right moment. Um, yes. Especially because we were doing some tricky stuff with virtualization. Because um, previously we had done like direct hardware builds, and now we were trying to like do we were doing some tricky stuff with Vagrant, and I, it was a whole mess. So getting things to stop at the right point was um, always a fun thing. All that can be done without it being too messy, but yeah, it's hard to avoid. Well, I, I was also maybe not the best at my job at times, so <laughs> I was learning. We'll put it that way. <laughs> um, so now I, I've got um, compilation enabling directly success and fail in indication, but also enabling unit test running. Is that right? Correct. And then unit test running also feeds into success slash fail indication. And I'm I'm being a little bit hand wavy here in saying that that enables build, uh, even though unit tests aren't necessarily about building. But what we get... it is true. There, it's kind of a, a handshake there. They should go tightly together. Um, but if your tool doesn't have unit tests, it doesn't have it, right? Yeah. Okay. And then compilation produces artifacts, which is important to the publish step. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna put artifacts. Here. Let me see here, under publish and enabled by compilation. And if, what, if you'd like to put some details in there, you yeah. would put your you know best practices for code checks, your security checks, and everything. Go right there with the unit test. These are all things you can add on. Oh right, okay, yep. So. Um, what would is it like code quality or best practices? Yeah, code quality and best practices. Okay. And security tests. This is step one of security testing. Is just getting a good code review on it. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, security practices. And with with this kind of, um, I'm imagining like Veracode style. Um, you send us our code, your code, and then we like check it for certain patterns, like places where you could leak things and. I, I don't know what I'm talking or, about here. <laughs> no, no, the um, shell check will get really, really mad if you have variables in an RM-RF. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a good one. That's, that's a security check that happens with code review. Excellent, okay. And so then you get um, a different kind of success and fail indication from each of those you know, quality practices, security practices. Now, now here's a question. What... What about enforcement? Like one of the big problems, and enforcement is a weird word for this maybe, but one of the problems that I encountered was how, how do you help people care that something failed? And so I'm curious about what your experiences have been around, let's say a code quality test fails versus a security test fails versus a unit test failure. Like what are the different kind of flavors of experience that you've had with each of these? So it, it, it's across the board. A lot of people will dive in and try to understand the tool. And then there's some people that just throw their hands into the chat room and say, help. <laughs> uh, it, it really varies on their understanding of the tools themselves. From a process standpoint um, for the organization, though, is there, is there like a, uh, an agreement? Like one of the things with SRE that I think about is the negotiation of agreements 
where like you might say, hey, we're not going to take code. We're not going to deploy code that hasn't that hasn't passed certain quality tests or certain security tests from a process standpoint. Does that kind of thing happen too? Does that the forcing function that at least gets people to raise their hand and say help? Yes. In fact, for us, we require code sign off, right? So two people have to have looked at the code mm. and quite often it's more than two because we want with our operating system under the hood, we want more eyes on it, the better. Okay, so so code review practices, um, getting two people's eyeballs on it, enables that kind of code quality assertion and sign off in a sense, and a little bit more pride in what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, that's a nice uh, a nice follow on. Like, hey, we, we're we're producing good work. Um, I like that. I'm I'm actually going to add um, pride in work as a capability. We we call it pride in ownership. It's ours. Yep. I did that. You did that. We did that. Good stuff. And Margaret asks a good question here. And I'm, I'm using acronyms, which is always a, a bad thing to do, because especially because nobody knows what the initialisms mean or whatever. SRE here means Site Reliability Engineering. And it's um, there's a free book online that you can read. In particular, there's a really good chapter on um, SLOs, which is Service Level Objectives. And the weird version that I've been indoctrinated to believe about SRE and SLO is it's kind of like a way of creating agreements across boundaries in the organization. And it doesn't even have to be between operators and developers. It could be between any kind of um, different functions or different sections of the business. I think it's really about setting expectations. And um, I think the word Jabe, uh, Jay Bloom, who's a mentor of mine, uh, the word that he uses for this is interpredictability. And it's it's not so much that I agree with everything that you're doing over there in dev land. It's that I know what to expect. Like maybe my preference- And provide is, options. Yeah, yeah. Like the site resilience is not, site resilience isn't new. The, the fact is that it's so complicated that we need specialists nowadays. It, it, and specialists who, who care about SRE are, are not just going to be in an ivory tower, right? Like they're hopefully coaching folks. They're hopefully like sharing the practices and, and even facilitating some of, I think some of those conflict uh, or, or negotiation kind of conversations too. Is that kind of what you've seen or is like, is, are there different flavors to this as well? As, as I've watched our SR team improve and grow and, everything they basically sit like you've said between dev and ops and play on both fields so i've seen both dev done by them and operations done by them mm -hmm. it's their goal is to make it all easier for everybody though yeah it, one of the explanations of devops that i've heard that's been really fascinating is, and it, this is from jay bloom as well is like if you take a venn diagram and um, instead of trying to smash dev and ops together into one thing like just make everyone do everything. Um, let's think about the, the overlap between those two places and the practices, going back to social practice theory, the practices that we would need within that overlap, the things that we would need to care about together. Um, and I think that's just a really interesting way of, of looking at it. And so that's where the SRE plays and they, they play elsewhere too. But that Yes, seems like I like that definition. It's the things we play with together, right? Yeah, um, better together, right? Um, yes, it takes a village. Yeah. So we've got all of our kind of side checks here, unit tests, security practice um, checks. We've got our code quality, best practice checks. And, you know, as a result of that, kind of like pride and ownership coming out of all that. Um, and then we also have these artifacts that are coming out of compilation. And it's almost like we're asserting some, like all those tests assert something about the artifact. Um, and I'm kind of like curious what you view that assertion is and kind of like, how would you describe mm -hmm. that to someone else? I, I, I would say that as we reach, uh, what a hundred percent coverage, we reduce the risk of bugs to near zero mm. near. Okay. So what we're really aiming for is kind of a, an assertion of risk and and that kind of includes bugs 
Um, and bugs impact customer experiences. It's like anytime software does something unexpected. Um, yes. <laughs> I, and sometimes they think it's great, and hopefully you get to hear about that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I used to do um, part of the story I was telling earlier was about work um, in pharmacy systems, actually, so medical kind of kind of things, and so unexpected things there. Not so hot. <laughs> not so hot. Yeah, so we're trying to trying to keep things more or less ex- expected. And um, okay, so we've got an assertion of risk, uh, and it's kind of like a degree of risk or a degree of likelihood of bugs, and the coverage that we get from all of our different um, surface areas, right? Like there's there's threat of bugs, there's threat of exploitativity, like security concerns, um, and there's there's even just like quality. Uh, one of the like contributing factors to making things hard to change would be code that I can't read or code that obfuscates what it's doing. And so quality and best practices around there hopefully are helping with that. And all of that adds up to this assertion of risks um, that we're, we're assigning to these artifacts. And so then in the publish step, is there anything else around publish that um, like, do, do we code sign? Do we, um, I don't know. Re- release. Oops, the reason I keep publish and download separate mm. is because not every publish needs to be deployed. That's true. That's a very good point. Okay. That's that's really up to what your you know continuous delivery side looks like, right? If you've got it fully automated, monitored, automated rollbacks, etc., then sure, publish can be straight to production. Okay. If it's not that mature, you need another step. <laughs> <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And so I'm adding this thing under download, which is choice about when to deploy. And that seems really important, um, especially um, thinking about like some of the common arguments against CI and CD, especially for like enterprise organizations that are kind of catching up to these practices. It's like, why would I... I don't, why do I, I don't want to be Netflix. Why do I need to deploy a hundred times a day? You get lost. <laughs> um, well, you, you might not need to deploy a hundred times a day, but you should be able to. And I think that's the, the interesting thing here is it's a capability. It's optionality right. for the business. That's really great. Um, Kat Sotel uh, is in chat here too. Um, hi, Kat. And she, she says, I'm honestly shocked Jimmy hasn't gone on one of his signature rants against clever code during all this discussion of quality. So. I, it was really tempting when you started talking about unreadable code that to <laughs> jump on the, the bandwagon of, yeah, those people can go talk to HR. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. So there we go. Jimmy has some thoughts on that. And now we know what Jimmy's thoughts are. Um, so, yeah, we've got... <laughs> I love that. Uh, and, and Kat says, ha, that's funny. Um, okay, so we've got build, publish, and download. And we've got this choice about when to deploy. And the choice is, the choice is kind of based on the artifacts that are releasable. But it's also based on probably a number of other kind of like questions here. Like um, maybe actually our understanding of the value that's being released, going back to some of the cost of change, value of change, risk of change kind of factors here. Um, I'm going to be cheap and just copy those up here and put them underneath choice about when to deploy. Uh, and I don't know, does that match your model of how this stuff works? Or yes. are, are, that, are that matches things? reality very well, right? Especially for Ticketmaster, where quite often the values are delivered on big banks are on sales. Mm, okay. And so our operations people, doesn't matter what the change is. They're not going to do a deployment right before an on sale. It's not going to happen. Got it. Okay. So there are events and things like that, that kind of influence. Um, yeah. Yeah. This, this, these evaluations, you know, help to help us contextualize cost value and risk. Excellent. Okay. And so then from, okay, we've got artifacts enabling the choice about when to deploy. And um, this is, Artifacts are under publish and choice about when to deploy is under download. Is there anything else missing around publish and download that maybe we should include in this model? Not offhand, maybe somebody in the chat. Yeah, so if anyone thinks of something, by all means, uh, we're, we're interested. And then install. Um, 
You've got build, publish, download, install. Tell us about that a little bit. So install includes rollback. Okay, so we've got rollback. And um, what does install itself mean? And, and what does rollback mean in, in, uh, in terms okay. of that? Thing? Well, it, yeah, depending upon how mature your environment is, some people, an install is... Uh, not even presenting the product. They just get it available without the feature turned on. Ah, uh, okay. So this is interesting. Um, we've got some distinctions. But then if you make. think about like a browser and a computer, you know, that's not a thing. You install it, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. So so there's a lot of a lot that depends here. And so is installation availability? delivered or yeah exactly that i would say that's the case that once you've made it available okay. to the end user that's a, a big part of the step right because you need to monitor and make sure you're successful to be able to roll back and mm. and until you're modernized that's a human mm. yep checking manually is anybody screaming we deploy the code <laughs> okay and okay, so so just bridging the gap here, there's like download, which includes the choice about when to deploy. And does download also mean like placing the artifacts in the production environment? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna say placement in the environment. That's my shortcut word, right? Everybody does a download, but yeah, there's many versions of, of it, right? If you were K Kubernetes, it could be just getting your containers into the you know, repository into your hub. And I guess there's also a where question here with the environment. It's like which choice about when to deploy, but also where to deploy. Um, and that's often manual in, in less mature organizations, but I'm imagining that becomes yes. more automated as folks get kind of clear on, on like honestly the standard way. Different are... technologies treat that differently, right? Oh, okay, yeah. Some people get canary rollout. Some people can just do randomized traffic changes. Uh, so there are practices around choosing when and choosing where? Yeah, it could be. If it's a feature enabling, then you can say, oh, I'll just get 5% of my traffic from wherever they come. Mm. If it's spot instances you're upgrading and, and canarying it out, then that's the... Those are the users that get it. <laughs> yep, yep, that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, okay, yeah, so placement in the environment enables availability to the end user, but it also, um, let's see, there's like the monitoring part of that, which I want to capture. Um, is that observability? Is that is that a word people use in, in your neck of the woods? Mm, yeah, more, that's the reliability portion. Okay. I mean, that's half of what the SREs are doing is making sure that things are live and happy. Got it. Okay. So in your world, that's reliability and that, that involves like signals that things are going well. Yes. You know, there's the two parts. Did it blow up at startup right at launch or, <laughs> you know, did it show that it's degraded compared to the previous version? Okay, this is interesting. So launch and degradation. Um, those are the- Good, that was great. You drilled me down to that, by the way. I love mapping uh, with folks because like the, you already have the words, right? And that's, we just kind of like discover them. Um, let's see. Yeah, and, and Margaret says she hears observability sometimes and maybe observability makes reliability happen. Um, I definitely think it's a new enough term too that we're still figuring out what it means. Um, but some of the things that I've read about observability that I really like come from uh, the folks over at Honeycomb. Um, they've written a lot of really interesting stuff about that. Um, I don't know where else to go to learn about it though because uh, it's, it's kind of new to me as well. Let's see. Reliability. Um I liked her statement. Observability ability does drive reliability, right? If you can't tell how bad it is, then you're kind of screwed. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. So here's kind of like my proposal for how to model this part. Um, um, what I'm just typing up now is 
so we're underneath install and kind of at the bottom of the install and it still has to get connected back to the rest of the system but we'll start here signal slash monitoring um so like paying attention to the signs and they and i think that has to do with like having agents on machines scraping code output like all that kind of fun stuff that actually like produces signal um, and maybe thresholds and things like that. Maybe I, I don't know the qu quite how this works, but I think that enables observability with respect to launch and then observability with respect to degradation. Um, and that could enable yes. reliability. Does that seem like it works? Yes. Okay, excellent. And so we can assert that something is available to the end user if it's passed all these checks and it is, is reliable according to our indications. Yeah, functioning as expected. At least, you know, the regression version of everything, right? New functionality might need new monitoring of sorts. That's a different gig. That, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. And there's probably a lot of ways that these things are all cross-connected. And, and I don't know. It, it's probably more of a mess than what we're doing. But, but then um, I'm like, it, it, it can be. Yeah. Part of what we're hopefully doing is like by making a model of it, we're saying, well, this is how we think it works. And then we can go check against the, the code and what's actually happening to see if that's really how it works. And um, it, there's also this part of this where we're saying, maybe this is how we wish that it worked. And sometimes that helps us decide what changes to make to the process itself and how things are wired. I think when we're navigating from primarily manual systems to something that's more automated and more certain, um, we definitely can have that conversation uh, more often there about how to change things. Okay, so we've got placement in the environment and we've got reliability um, and all the checks that come associated with that. And those two things come together to produce availability for the end user. And then we have this rollback thing, which I, I kind of want to place this underneath reliability, like rollback um, yes, I like that. Okay. And that helps us kind of preserve availability for the end user. Okay. And once availability to the end user exists, is there anything that happens after that that we should kind of include in this build, publish, download, install pipeline conception? Well, not for pipelining. I mean, if we want to talk about design, yeah, you got to get your user feedback. Got it. Okay. But, so I'm going to oversimplify that part of the system, and I'm just going to kind of hand wave away and just say, okay, user feedback is enabled by... Yeah, I feel like that's a big giant step upward from what we're doing right now. <laughs> Definitely, for sure. And it's a big sticky note. I'm just going to hand wave away. And, and this is, um, I think people like to quote, Simon Wordley quoting George Box saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. But there's another George Box quote that doesn't get as much love, which is um, it's kind of important to know what's importantly wrong and what's not importantly wrong in our models. Um, so it's kind of like silly to be worried about mice in our models when there are tigers abroad <laughs> waiting to bite us. Um, and I'm paraphrasing. There be dragons. There be dragons. Yeah. So, so hand waving away user feedback. There probably be dragons in there. Um, but we're, we're, we're not paying attention to that because we're focused on this question of CICD. So, okay. So what I've kind of done here is created a basic value chain by basically we got to the value chain by stepping through the process. And that, I think one of the things I didn't expect to learn today was, um, one of the ways that value streams and value chains can work together and the value stream kind of gave us a framework of almost boxes to check, to look for components that are working together to produce value um, and help us model the value chain. And so in a weird way, there's this kind of shape of things that's happening right now where along the top, you have your big steps, build, publish, download, and install. But then along the bottom, corresponding to that process, you have from bottom left to top right, a kind of flow upwards that corresponds with that value stream. So it's like the value chain from bottom left to top right, corresponding with the value stream from left to right. And we haven't done anything with evolution yet. So like the position of components from left to right has more to do with the process than anything else. 
Um, and I think this is a valid structure. I think this is a completely valid way to make right. sense there, of the system. There's there's a lot of different ways to or challenges to look at, and each one probably requires its own map or its own version of a map. Yeah, I think definitely that's the case. And also, kind of at these different steps in the value, or I should say, um, at these different parts of the value chain going from bottom left to top right, the, there are particular components that connect back to the value stream. So for example, like satisfying the build step is the success fail indication. But we know that the success fail indication is also tied back to all these underlying components like unit tests and compilation and all this stuff. And meanwhile, publishing ties back to artifacts, but artifacts also imply like they implicate all of the other steps that had to happen to get artifacts like compilation and unit tests and all that other stuff. And it's, it's almost like as you move along the steps in the process, your dependency tree gets bigger and messier because there's more involved. And I think this creates a new appreciation for me of how much underlying dependencies low in the value chain enable higher level processes and, and from a value stream perspective, later processes. Um, so I, I don't know, that was just something that I'm, I'm surprised to kind of have an appreciation for coming out of this. When you get to be, say, in a fully matured or even close to fully matured, like everything is infrastructure as code, mm -hmm. then ops does not live on the CD side of this. Mm. Tell me what you mean by that, infrastructure as code. It mean, I, I mean that, so if you were, say, all Kubernetes and Helm, and literally your publish happens straight from your repositories to live environments. The operations is involved in keeping Kubernetes up and running. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so there's like a platform interface between operations and the developers that kind mm, of... Uh, it almost becomes completely separate at that point. Mm. Okay. Um, because it's infrastructure for your product becomes code and, and the developers become responsible for all of it. Oh, okay. So like developers can say in code, they can write a, a stance or a stanza, which is because that's a music term, a, a code block or, or whatever. Um, that's like, hey, I need infrastructure that looks like this. Yeah, I need two new I need two new VIPs and two new routes and and an extra piece of persistent storage. It's all just in a configuration file. Okay, and then Ops is running the system that interprets that and makes Correct. sense of it, and then has a has a basically like a a way of ensuring that that is the state that it produces. Okay, so there, that's one of those examples of negotiation. Then it's like Ops is saying if you give me a file that looks like this and conforms to these kind of standards and it has you give me within the limitations that yeah database one route that looks like this right you didn't ask for four petabytes when i've only got a two terabyte terabyte hard drive right yeah yeah <laughs> okay and then as margaret points out it's like then the deploys are just a developer hitting a button or the or the business making a decision and then saying okay hit that button now and, and then boom, you have value released to the customer and... And reliability goes up exponentially because the developer has their hand on the change from the single line of code all the way through the piece of monitoring. Okay. So we have about three minutes left in the stream and I, I want to do a little bit... Um, and, and first of all, Margaret's like, yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Um, but I want to maybe close us out with how we use evolution to inform our understanding of these systems. Um, what's, what's your take on evolution? Um, from I, I turn the maps, I turn the map sideways and I hang anvils off of everything. And the lower down it is, the more anvils it has. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to follow along here. I, so that's my favorite analogy for the evolution. Like, <laughs> when it when it comes to automation, the less mature it is, mm -hmm. the harder it's going to be to move everything else on the map. Oh, so it's almost like a gravity well kind of. Yes, that's the other thing I was thinking is put a little black hole on the right hand side of the map. Oh my goodness, that's okay. This is blowing my mind. Okay, so for for everyone else following along, 
in, in worthy mapping, what we tend to do is we use the left right position to indicate stage of evolution. And if you need to like um, get an idea of what evolution is all about, you can always pull up the table that Simon has um, at lwm.events slash evolution. That'll, it's kind of like a short code um, that I've set up to kind of redirect you to that table. And I'm pulling that table up now for everyone to see. It, it's big and messy and scary, but it's actually kind of okay. It's, it's easier to read than you think. And what we do is we basically say evolution says, depending on how evolved something is from stage one to stage four, it has different qualities. And so what Jimmy's kind of pointing out here is like stuff in stage one, starting towards stage two, because it's high failure, because it's about gambling and driven by gut, because it's about high future worth and immediate investment, but it's something we poorly understand. And just to compare that to stage four, like all the opposites of that, right? Simple, known, low failure, all that kind of stuff. Because things in stage one are like that, they're like heavier and harder to change and harder to work with. Um, so I, that's really fascinating. And another thing that comes to mind too is that the relationships get really weird. Um, if you depend on something yeah. that's in stage one or stage two, uh-oh. Like, or impossible in some cases. You, it makes you add a new custom commodity to keep the two connected. Yeah, so we got to like pay attention to not just the components and the relationships, but also the compositions of all of those things together. Um, right, the farther away they get from each other in the evolution, it actually gets more complicated than less. Okay, that's really insightful. And I, I think, um, especially when people are making like, like oversimplifying it as build or buy decisions, but more commonly, I think in the enterprise at least, it's... Um, we've already built this thing <laughs> and it's weighing us down and not letting us pursue other things. How do we transition to using commodity uh, sort of resources or are we constrained in a way that means we have to own this at least for the foreseeable future? And can we at least acknowledge that? Acknowledgement would be, yeah, huge if you can, because then you can commit to your connection product and make it a first class citizen type thing. I used to work in, in like university settings in higher education and like it was one of the problems we've always had was like, we're not a startup. We can't just start over with all the things that startups are doing these days. So like we have commitments and we have to honor those commitments. And so that, that means we need to at least acknowledge that those commitments exist. And they kind of okay. wish people wouldn't think that all startups work the same because most of them fail, but that's okay. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. I've, I, I accept that rebuke, and I... <laughs> for, well, I, I heard that at, at our company for years. We need to be as, you know, agile as a startup. And I'm like, well, that's not a thing. Yeah, like, well, wait, it's survivor bias. Like, first of all, <laughs> those are the ones that haven't crashed and burned that you're holding up on a pedestal. Um, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but but it's also like, we just need to get, get real about what the value of the capabilities that those startups are, are like, they're instances of right? Like, hey, I, we can deploy 10 times a day, whatever. Like, aren't we cool? Well, what capability does that represent? What, what does that enable the business to do? We need to have a very, I think, clear-headed view of what those are and whether they're worth pursuing. Yes. And some of the things that may not seem intuitive, believe the data. More releases reduce bugs. It's just pure fact. You can't deny it. You exercise the pathway and Kat said some of this stuff around chaos engineering too. It's like firing a flare through a dark cave that you haven't visited in a while to remind yourself what it looks like. It's like a way of tracing those steps repeatedly and repeatedly. And that way you hit failure sooner when it doesn't matter so much and you can fix it instead of uh, <laughs> releasing with a big bang. And then when things do go bang, <laughs> going, yeah, oh, wow. big, big bang releases are my favorite to avoid. <laughs> the way that you phrased that was just beautiful. Um, they're my favorite to avoid. <laughs> well, That's Jimmy, my outro mark. Yeah, excellent. Jimmy, thank you so much for spending your time with us and making a, a, a value chain and, and sort of the, the beginnings of a map um, for a CICD pipeline. This is going to help a lot of people, I think, um, take their first steps into worldly mapping. And I want to thank you for that contribution and, and really just for spending time with me here. Uh, really appreciate it. No, yeah, no, thank you. It's a privilege. I'm, I'm a little flattered here. 
<laughs> hey, well, uh, if I can flatter you, um, I'm going to be happy with myself because I, I love getting all these different perspectives because the more we have examples of people literally doing the thing um, and doing the thing in all these different ways, right? Like the anchor analogy, so helpful. Um, I'm going to run away with that. I'm going to steal it. So, <laughs> but I'll, I'll give you please, credit. Please, please do. Yep. Um, having more experiences of different people trying those different kinds of things and looking at it in different ways means the, the two, three people who needed to see that particular way of saying things, um, it's going to unlock this whole world for them. So, and that's what, that's what these live streams are all about is having a lot of different examples. Um, so people can find that unlock moment. Um, anyway, thank you so much for being here. And to all you folks in chat who followed along and watched with us, thank you. Uh, we're really grateful that you showed up and turned out. And if there's anything that you would like to see us doing with live streams, um, or with anything else along those lines, let us know. Um, you can find me at Ben at higheredthought.com by email or follow me at hired thought dot, uh, at hired thought on Twitter. Uh, Jimmy, if folks wanted to follow you or pay attention to the kind of work that you're doing, where can they find you on, uh, in the wide world? It's, yeah, it's only on Twitter. It's Jimmy the Judd. And uh, yeah, I don't social media very much. I, I listen a lot. So if you reach out to me, I will respond. Excellent. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make sure that uh, Jimmy's handle is in the description of this video if you're watching later. Um, I think it might be there now, actually, because um, my amazing VA is amazing, getting all that kind of stuff figured out. Um, thank you, everyone. And with that, I'll say goodbye. It's been lovely to have you all.